Hey, and welcome back to day 26 of the 31 day challenge. And today is a big autogen update. The update actually happened a few days ago. It was version 0.2.20, but I'm going to go over all the updates. Now, as I say, there are quite a few updates and some ones that I really like. So let's get started with them. This is version 0.2.20. And as you can see here, there are quite a few changes. The first one I'm going to go over is state flow, building LLM workflows with customized state oriented transition function and group chat. That was a lot, but basically state flow is this right here based on the current state in the context history the state flow model determines the next state to transit to essentially we are sending different instructions to an llm to ask it to perform different actions based on its current status in state flow they constructed a state machine to control a single llm sending different instructions based on different states however basically with state flow agents each agent can be a different llm based on the different state that we're at there made some experiments right uh the p stands for prompt m is for the llm response and then e is for execution so for an SQL task, you know, we have an initiation, an observation, and then a select, verify, and end. So, so let's say this is a state flow, right? So we're in the select state. Well, I think this is trying to come up with probably the statement. Um, it goes to verify, and then if that errors out, if you know the statement doesn't work after it's trying to be executed, then it goes back um, into the select, say, hey, that didn't work, try it again, and kind of keeps going until it's verified and it's successful, and then we end. But what they're, I, but I believe with the state flow agents, each of these states is kind of its own agent. And then you can use different models for each agent. And you know, some models might be better things you might not need. This might actually help you save on cost because just maybe coming up with the statement, right? Like say you're not using fully local, you might, you could use 3.5 turbo just to come up with the statement, right? It's probably good enough just for that. And then they have this metric here. There are two different baselines that they go by to compare um, the state flow and state flow agents. So the first one is react, which stands for reasoning and action, I believe. Um, it's a few shot prompting method that prompts the model to generate thoughts and actions. Then there's plan and solve, which is a two-step prompting strategy. I think the React probably costs a little bit more. If it's bold, it came in first. If it's underlined, it came in second. So you can see the state flow and the state flow agents uh, basically dominated this for the most part, except for the plan to solve. It looks like a 3.5 turbo came in second with cost. But generally what they're saying is this is a better, this is better overall to use this uh, type of orchestration. So now what does it look like in code? All right. So we have an, an initializer, a coder, an executor, and a scientist. The coder and the scientists are uh, assistant agents. The initializer and the executor are the user proxy agents. So how this is done is there's a state transition method that they have. So they you take in the last speaker or the last agent that talked and then the overall group chat that you that were uh, all the agents are comprised of. So it starts with the initializer, right? So if the last speaker, if the initializer just, you know, uh, just went right. That was a, like, they're trying to talk to somebody. The initializer just went in the conversation. Then it goes to the coder. If the last speaker is then the coder, then it goes to the executor. And it kind of, this is how it plays out, right? So you're kind of saying, okay, if this was the last person, then move on to the next one. And you, this is a way to uh, control by kind of having a transition graph of how you want the conversation to go. Because if you want, like for instance here, they have the last speaker is the executor, right? So it went, so it went initializer, coder, and then executor. The executor, which would be a user agent, had an exit code of one saying that whatever they tried to execute failed, then go back to the coder. But if it was successful, then only now you can go on to the scientist. And then if you return none, that means that you're done. Okay, and how they add that is in the group chat, there is an extra parameter called speaker selection method. So again, I think there are um, so a few, like quite a few versions ago, I kind of covered. Um, they had something where they had a finite state machine, so they had a bunch of different examples. And I think they're trying to dive more into this, which is just another way to orchestrate all of our agents. And then they have an image generation capability, which essentially what this is doing is they're defining functions that can return an agent, but that agent is able to uh, create images from like uh, Dolly, for instance. And what this is really, I mean, what this is doing, this is really just compacting um, image creation inside of an agent. They have it set up for Dolly 3, which you would need your OpenAI API key and it would, you know, cost money. And then they have a function where they can ex actually extract the image from the conversation that you had between the agents. So for instance here, right, they have uh, Dolly, the image generator agent, and they have a critic. They have a critic agent, they have the image prompt, and then they get the result from saying Dolly dot initiate the chat. They want a happy dog wearing a t-shirt saying I love autogen. And then down here, you say, you see, we have images equals extract images from the Dolly and the critic uh, chat that we just that we just created. And then here are the two images that were extracted from that agent. So this is just this is just kind of another way where you can use agents, you kind of uh, put the code inside of an agent to actually create something like images, they have updated their gallery. So if you come to their gallery, you know, so this is this is basically in their blog. They are always updating this, and they have a bunch of updated projects that people have worked on. Um, you can probably find you can also find these in the Discord channel, 
but you know this is always being updated so if you're looking for something that you want to also try out you can come here and check this out and try one of these and then there were some autogen studio updates okay so it says that the updates are they have an upload and download of skills and workflows so we could already download the workflows. We've done that before in previous versions, but looks like you can now also upload workflows, then upload and download skills. So if you start up Studio, go to the build section and then go to skills. For instance, here's the generate images. This is there by default. This just generates images from Dolly 3. You can, looks like you can now download the JSON file that has this skill. And then, <clears throat> And then also in this ellipses up here in the top right where you can create a new skill, just click the ellipses and then you can choose upload skill. And then you can also put in the skill that we just downloaded. I can name this uh, 01, save. And now I have that skill that I just uploaded. And you can do the same thing for workflows. So if you go to workflows, let's download the travel agent workflow, click on the ellipses, which again is by new workflow, right? You can create a new workflow or click ellipses, click upload workflow, and then you can upload a workflow that you had downloaded from somebody else potentially. And then here is our new workflow. And I, I really think this is good for sharing uh, skills and workflows between each other. This is a great way to allow that to work. So th they also let you stream applies. There's an agent message summarization. All that means is now if you go to your workflow, the last summary method here, by default, I think it was, you can only choose none or last, but now you can also summarize it by the LLM response. You could click this and then that could be, you could choose that as your summary method. And then they support uh, Azure AI search. Okay, so there's a couple here that I'm gonna go over next that I think are pretty cool. So there's a tutorial about tool use. So basically what it's saying is that we can create tools and then register them to an agent and use them in our uh, workflow. So let's say you want to create a calculator that had basic, uh, the basic multiplication, addition, subtraction, and division operations. So they chose to use if else if statements to create this. They're just taking in two different parameters and then we're choosing the operator, but we won't be choosing it. The agents will be choosing. How this works is you're going to take the assistant agent, register for LLM, name is going to be calculator, and you give the description and they have the parentheses here, this tool called calculator. Then you do the same thing for user proxy, where you register for execution, give it the name, and then in parentheses, you put the calculator tool. So this is kind of similar to what we talked about function calling, right? This isn't function calling, this is registering tools. Whereas function calling was similar, but this would be above the actual function. Or you can register the function this way by actually just calling a register function and then pass in all the parameters that you need. So how is it used, right? So we say user proxy.initiate chat with the assistant, and the message is this math equation right here, right? It's basically just a bunch of different operations. So here it is, user to the assistant, solve this problem basically. So the assistant is going to automatically say suggested tool call is calculator. And it's going to take in uh, the first arguments that it thinks that you should um, have math operations on. So it's going to say take 13,312 divided by 232 minus 32 with the division operation. That gives an error because I don't think it likes the subtraction there with the comma. I don't think, I just don't think it likes how that is working. It's not JSON format, right? It should probably be in quotes. So then it's, then it says uh, do it, then it does the subtraction says now uh, divide 13,312 by 200. So it does that, gets a response, and then it basically moves on to the next one. So now up here, it's going to take this number plus the result of this. It's going to do that, give the response back. You know, it's only using that calculator tool. And then finally, it's going to take the result of that and multiply by five, which was the last thing. The thing here is it's deciding by itself because, you know, it's using PEMDAS, or I assume, and it knows where in the equation, what to use first on the calculator tool. And then what it does is you can actually um, say assistant.llm config tools. And this gives a schema that is similar to OpenAI's tool use API. Okay, this is something I would like to explore more, but this is just how we're, they're starting to integrate tools in with the agents. And the other thing that I'm pretty excited about is they now are trying to integrate other like alternative open source models to make it better for the agents. I want, I want to say better, but I want to say make it smoother and actually integrate it in with the agents. For instance, I've talked about LM Studio in here before. So out of these, I'm just going to use that as my first reference. And what they have here, so what you can see here is they have two different uh, open source models. Let's take Phi2 as the first model. So in the config list, which you know, we have a model the base URL and API key. So for the API key, you can just say LM Studio, 
for the base UR, this is LM Studio's actual URL once you start the server, and then you can give the actual model name here. Model name is not exactly accurate. It's more like the model card name, right? This is, this is the full name that you would give here. And what this actually allows you to do, because there was a big update, which we're going to cover in another video, to LM Studio in version uh, 17, I think, they're allowing for multi-model agents. You see here, we actually have two of the, sa the same server but because we define the model differently, we can actually completely talk to just LM Studio with different models now under just running one piece of software from LM Studio. Like I said, this is just a version from LM Studio, and this is just a simple chat where they're completely talking to two different open source models using Autogen. So I would say definitely check these out. I am gonna do a video on that update from LM Studio because it was kind of big. Then with Autogen's big update, they kind of interact really well together now. They added more to their notebooks. There was just you know some bug fixes. And then the last thing is RAG. They're really trying to use RAG, uh, create like RAG agents, and they already have it just didn't seem to me very intuitive. I feel like they're trying to make them easier to use. For instance, they have a RAG assistant agent and a RAG user proxy agent. So for the user proxy agent, right, they have a number of different properties here. You know, one of the big ones is the client. So here you can see that they're using Chroma DB for the vector database. They have an embedding model here. You know, they get the model from their uh, config list, which, you know, we don't see here, That that's okay. And it looks like document paths that they uh, actually reference two different two uh, markdown examples. And then what I can see here, you know, like I said, they don't really have the result of this example either, but so they have the RAG proxy agent, which is the user agent, and she can chat with the, the RAG assistant agent. So the user agent comes up with a message problem. So the code problem, right? So the code problem is just how can I use Flamel to perform a task and use Spark to do parallel training? Then they have this thing called search string equals Spark. This seems to me like the more important one here. What this is doing, the search string is used as an extra filter for the embedding search. In this case, we only want to search for documents that contain Spark. So when it searches for the embeddings in the vector database, this is gonna help kind of with a similarity search to give you better results. And they do have some examples here. So I think in, in time that uh, having RAG uh, agents will be better, but it's still, with this case, it still requires some setup um, kind of actually, I mean, whenever you're using RAG in general, because you have to have the vector store, you have to have the embeddings, you have to maybe, you maybe want to save the vector database locally, you know, it still requires some setup either way. I believe they're trying to make it so it's easier. You can just actually have agents that already exist and then use them to create your whole RAG um, workflow. Okay, those are the updates. Let me know what you think about them in the comment section down below so that we can discuss them. Like I said, there were quite a few, but what I think from this and what I think they're really going towards is having everything in an agentic workflow. So even something as image generation or using RAG, they're really trying to make it so they have the agents already there. And you don't have to give it some of the properties or parameters to make it happen. Here's some more videos on Autogen. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next video.